Well, if you would this morning, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and our text this morning, of course, will be in verses 6 and 7, but we're going to read verses 4 through 7 uh, for the context of this. And again, uh, out of honor for God's Word, would you please stand as we read these verses of Scripture? But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. May the Lord bless his holy word. You may be seated. So we have now been some weeks in this particular uh, passage of Scripture. And of course it is, as we've seen throughout chapter 1 and the first portion of this chapter, Uh, rich in the truth of God. And of course, in the first three verses we reviewed, or Paul reviewed initially with those Ephesian believers and to those where this letter was circulated in Asia Minor about what we were in the past. The first chapter deals with what we are, the, the rich blessings that we have by being in Christ. And then in chapter 2, the Apostle Paul there reminds us of where we used to be, what we used to be, as he talked there about Being, as he said here, dead in trespasses, walking according to the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, who is Satan, and among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. We were children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But then, those wonderful words that he interjects there in verse 4, but God, but God, but God intervened. If God had not intervened and left us to ourselves, Well, we know what the end of that would have been. We understand what that would have been. Eternal separation from God apart from Him under punishment for our sin. But God, in mercy, rich in mercy, not just having mercy, but rich in mercy. Why? Because of the great love with which He loved us. His motivation was His great love, and we talked somewhat about that in the scriptures this morning, even before the foundation of the world that God loved. God loved. He chose to show love with which he loved us. And even when we were dead in these trespasses, how that even though dead, left to ourselves, we could not achieve our own salvation, but he made us alive together with Christ. And we talked about this before over in chapter 1 and verses 19 there and 20 about how that this speaks of the life-giving, regenerating power of God in bringing us to life and that this is the same as the power of God in resurrecting the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we reach this point this morning and he brings to us again, he reminds us that we are raised up with him, speaking of Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. And I just wanted for a moment to focus upon this phrase, the heavenly places, because Paul loves this particular phrase. It's used a number of times in the scriptures in the book of Ephesians. Uh, Here, I believe it is, six times that he uses this particular phrase in regards to our relationship of being in Christ in the heavenly places and the benefits of that. And Paul was obsessed with that. And that's a good thing to be obsessed with, is it not? To be thinking of heaven, to have our minds on heaven. People, I've heard the phrase used before, well, some people are too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. I haven't found those people yet. We are as believers to be heavenly minded. Paul was heavenly minded. 
As I was talking with Brother Chester last evening as I visited with him and, and talking about heaven, and Brother Chester believes he's very close to that. But we were talking about Paul. And Paul said, it would be far better for me if I was not in this body and with Christ. But it's more needful for you that I still be here. Every believer really ought to have that mindset. That we would be better off to be in heaven. We understand that. That we would be better off to be in heaven. To be with Christ. To be in a place of eternal peace. In the presence of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. But these thoughts of Christ in the heavenly places and us being in Christ and with Christ in the heavenly places should preoccupy the minds, I think, of all believers, should it not? Not just the Apostle Paul, not just the people, those that wrote the scriptures, but all of us should be preoccupied with that thought. Our citizenship, as we understand it, spiritually is not here. We understand from what is said in Hebrews chapter 11 that Abraham sought for a city whose builder and maker was God. And that those that were there knew that there was a not a, just a country here on earth that they were seeking, but there was a far better country, the heavenly country. Also, as we talk about heavenly places, as we talk about this in relationship to us, why we should be thinking about these things and what, what this spiritual reality here that he's talking about that we're going to explain more, but we are not in bondage to sin any longer. We live in the freedom of Christ. In Romans eight twenty one. we are no longer bound to sin or the curse of sin. We're no longer ruled in the, to, by the bondage in the domain of sin and death and Satan as we talked about here in these first three verses of Ephesians 2. But we are ruled by what? The domain of the righteousness of God, the eternal life that has been bestowed upon us by God and in reality indwelled by the life of God in us. We no longer, as the scripture says, as we talked about, as we read this scripture this morning in Colossians 1, that we no longer live our lives according to the flesh, no longer according to the world or the dictates of that old bondage of sin, but we are living according to the Spirit of God, as Paul talks about in Romans 8 and 14. Our life, which is, in etern which is eternal, is in reality, as I have said, having the life of God within us that comes through the blessed Holy Spirit. As it says in 1 Corinthians 6, that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in every one of us that are a child of God. It is His life in our souls. It is heavenly life in us even in this present world. As we saw, as we talked talk through John not that long ago, and Jesus talked about this, to, that to believe in him is to have eternal life. And to have eternal life means it will never be separated from us. What can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, but nothing can separate us either from that eternal life that God has given to all of his children, to those that, as Paul talks about in this place, are in the heavenly places in Christ and with Christ. And the life that we now live, Paul said over in Galatians 2 and 20, it's not our life, but it is in the life of Christ that is in us by faith. The love that we have now is not a love and a desire for this world, but it is a love for Christ. It's a love for the people of God, for His church, and a love for the kingdom of God. Why are you in this body this morning? Why have you come to worship? Well, I hope and pray it's because that you are seated with Christ and you have a love for God and you have a love for God's people and you want to be among God's people. 
We're no longer children of wrath. As Paul talked about here, we are no longer children of wrath with the promise of the judgment of God. But we are children with a promised glorious inheritance as 1 Peter 1 and 4 talks about a glorious, marvelous inheritance that we have awaiting us. So like Paul, I would say, we should be preoccupied and enthralled with the consideration of this phrase, the heavenly places, and how that relates to us as believers in the present time and in the future. And as I said, there are several places here in the book of Ephesians that speak of these heavenly places. And Ephesians 1 and 3 speaks of us having every spiritual blessing presently in the heavenly places. Ephesians 1 and 20 speaks of Christ being seated at the Father's right hand in the heavenly places, and we are spiritually seated with them there. Ephesians 2 and 6 here, and 7 that we are talking about here, speaks of we are raised up by the resurrection power of Christ and seated with him in the heavenly places. Ephesians 3 and 10 speaks of the manifold wisdom of God being revealed to rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. And then in Ephesians 6 and 12, when we're talking about the spiritual warfare, it speaks of our cosmic, the cosmic powers and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That exists. There are a lot of people that don't believe in anything but the here and now, which is a very sad thing. Isn't that a very sad thing? To think that, well, you might as well go for all the gusto now and live your life to the fullest because this is all there is. Well, that's basically a denial of God and And it says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. It's only a fool that says there is no eternity. That man does not have a soul. But we can rejoice this morning as the people of God because we are... We know from the scriptures that we are in Christ in the heavenly places. And I won't go through them again, but we talked about back over there in chapter 1. There were basically 10 spiritual blessings, and that's probably the minimum that we could talk about, that we have in Christ in the heavenlies. And then we talk about this phrase here, raised up with him. So what does this phrase, raised up with him, mean? Well, we've already talked about it somewhat extensively, as we've said in the discussion of chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, in chapter 2, verse 5, but it is the resurrection power of Christ that raises us up, that regenerates us, that gives us life when we are saved. Salvation is a resurrection from spiritual death to spiritual life. The same power, as we said, of God that raised Christ from that grave in the garden tomb in Jerusalem is the same power that awakened and gave life to every single child of God that has ever been saved, is ever going to be saved. Everyone that's ever been saved, everyone in this present day that's being saved, everyone in the future that will ever be saved are saved in the same way. It is through the resurrection power of God. It is that same miracle there. People look at the the miracle of the resurrection of Christ and say, wow, what a tremendous miracle. Yes, it is. But guess what? If you're a child of God and you have the Spirit of God in you and you know that because you cry out, Abba, Father, to Him, you can know that that same resurrection occurred in you. It occurred in you. So many people, as I thought about this, I thought about, wow, what a tremendous truth that is that we possess in this day and time as the children of God to know that, to know that I have been raised from the dead by the Spirit of God. I have been given life. My eyes were open to the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ, to my need of Him, for my need of repentance from sin. And and I laid hold of Him, or He laid hold of me more specifically in that. And He pulled me up from my death, and He gave me life, and He adopted me as a child of God. And we have so many promises in that. But so many people seem to have no hope in this present world. Do you you get that? We live in a very tumultuous, so much turmoil, so much dissatisfaction. And they think, well, if you give us 
You know, if we have more education, that'll satisfy me. If I live in a bigger house, that'll satisfy me. If I get justice, that'll satisfy me. All of these different things, if you just just will acclimate yourself to what I think, it'll satisfy me. But the reality of that is, is it won't. All the things that the world will give are nothing, ultimately. We understand from the prophecy of Scripture that one day all of this is going to go away. It's all going to be burned up. It's all temporary. And any power or prestige or standing that you have is going to be gone. It's going to be gone. But I'm confident of this, that God is going to continue to save the lost sinners. He's going to continue to build His church. The gates of hell, the Scripture says, will not prevail against it. The work of the Spirit of God and the resurrection power of Jesus Christ will continue. Let me say this. We, we talk about people think, and I see this all the time, well, it certainly must be the time of God's come, Christ coming again because things are so dark. And it is, I mean, I, I agree. There's, it's a difficult time. Much more difficult in other parts of the world than it is in our culture. Just let's be perfectly honest. I mean, some people in our culture think, well, if I'm insulted on social media for putting some post, I'm being persecuted. Give me a break. That's not persecution. What well, we talked about a little while ago about homes being looted and burned and churches being burned, that's persecution. Those that died during the time of the early church, that's persecution. Rome's persecution of the church in the early ages when they used to put, Nero used to put Christians on, stake them on a post and cover them in oil and light them up with fire. That's persecution, dying for that. That's persecution. During the Reformation time or during those Middle Ages when, when people were drawn and quartered for their testimony for Christ and burned at the stake, that's persecution. But it hadn't stamped out the church. It hasn't stamped out the work of God. And what's going on today in China, in India, and in the Middle East, and all of these things, yes, it's, it's diff- it is persecution. It's a dark time. But in the midst of all of that, the work of God is continuing to go on. Because the Holy Spirit, the resurrection power of God and salvation is not hindered. Who can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? He is going to accomplish his purpose through, he is going to continue to raise up dead sinners from their spiritual death and he is going to continue to quicken sinners with his Holy Spirit and he's still going to continue to bless his gospel and he's still going to pour out his spirit upon the preaching of that gospel and as Brother Elijah taught this morning about the called, he's going to continue to call the called through the gospel. And through the word of God. So the work of God is not going to be overcome. And he talks about here when Paul speaks here of we are raised up with him. He is speaking of our union with Christ. Our vital spiritual union with Christ. If you know, if you are saved by the grace of God. There is life there. The Spirit is life. The Spirit is there, as he says in Romans 8 and 10. Then we read the scripture this morning. Brother Stephen read over there in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. But those first four verses are really what speaks there to what we are in Christ, of being raised up. And it talks about since we have been raised with Christ, we are in the present to seek the things above. Heavenly things, heavenly thoughts, heavenly knowledge. Seek the things that are above. What are you seeking? People want to talk about what defines a Christian. What are indicators, fruit of Christianity? If the Spirit of God indwells you and you are seeking those things 
of that are first of the kingdom of God, that is an indication that the work of the Holy Spirit has done a salvific work in you and that you are a believer. And what Paul is telling the Colossian believers here is, is seek those things that are above where Christ is. We are to look into those things. We should be ravaging the word of God, should we not? You want to seek the thing what he's talking about here? Look into the word of God. Grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is what we're supposed to be doing. This is the norm for Christianity, for a true Christian, is to grow in the knowledge of Christ and the things and hunger for the truths of Scripture. This is an evidence of, of, of a Christian. Where there is life, there is a hunger for the things of Christ. There is a hunger for the things of heaven, the heavenly places, the heaven, to be heavenly minded. And trust me, you're never going to get all of it that's in this word. You're never going to learn all of it. I've been a believer for since I was nine years old. And in all honesty, I've been a preacher in some sense of the word for 50 but there's so much more. The more I study it, the more that I don't know. I learn that I don't know. You know. And so it's like this giant mine that you keep going into. And the farther that it gets, it just sorts of starts to really expand out there. And you keep mining and mining, and you'll never get to the end of it. You'll never get down to that. But he also says here in Colossians 3 that if you have been raised with Christ, he said, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are... Now let me say something here. This is not accidental. Set your mind on things that are above. Now the first part of that verse means to earnestly dispose yourselves in a certain direction to intensively interest oneself in or with. We are to intensively set our minds on the things that are above of heaven. It does not happen by you putting your Bible under your pillow at night. And also let me say this, say this, as believers, it doesn't happen by you bringing your Bible to church on Sunday and then laying it aside for six days and then saying, where's my Bible for Sunday morning? You understand that? It means you are in the Word daily. You are seeking God daily. Daily. This is what we are to be. This is what we are to do is intentionally to earnestly look and set our minds on the things that are above. Because why? Because he says, for you have died. Your life is hidden with Christ and God. We are to walk in this newness of life. Empowered by the Holy Spirit. Our minds, our affections now are not to be set on the world and the love of the world. But they are to be set passionately, intentionally on the things of heaven. The things of God. The things of the kingdom of God. And let me say this. Let me ask you the question. What are your affections set on at this stage in your life? I don't care whether you're young or old. What are your affections set on? I mean, we can all set our affections on many things. We're told to examine ourselves, to examine our walk with the Lord. And how easily, because why are we told to do that? Why, did, why, why is that told us in the scriptures? Why are we urged to do that? Because easily and quickly our minds can be drawn away from this single-mindedness. Can be distracted from this, what Paul is talking about here, to other things. Work and career. Work's important. God told us we need to work. But that doesn't place the, take the place of being our minds set on the things of heaven. Education. Education can be good. 
I'm a little suspect of public education in this day and time. I hope I don't offend anybody with that. Family. Family is good. You know what I love to see? What we've seen over the last year is God bringing people into the church that have families, children, things like that. Some that are about to have families. <laughs> They're about to be. Those are good, but they don't place, take the place of setting our minds on the things of God. Other things that seem to slide in before long, what happens? Our love for Christ has grown cold. And I thought about this. I was listening to, to a message yesterday. I heard part of a message by, by John MacArthur and, and how he, how are we disciplined or how are we to examine ourselves? And you remember after Jesus resurrected from the dead and, and Peter, of course, had denied him three times. But he goes out one and finds out Peter and the apostles and they're out here fishing. You remember the story? And the first question he asked Peter there, he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Now, some people have surmised about that, but I think he was talking about, Peter, do you love me more than these fishing boats here? These fishing nets? Do you love me more than this, what you're doing? We need to examine ourselves to say, do, what do we love the most? Is our love for Christ what it ought to be? Are we setting our minds on these things? Are our minds so much in the heavenly places in Christ that we are being obedient to the word of God and recognizing this is what we are to be doing? We can do that. We should all do self-examination, including myself. Where are we in respect to our love for Christ right now? Perhaps compared to a year ago, six months ago. Is our commitment to the Lord and our love for the Lord growing more now? Or can we look back and say, oh, you know what? I can look back and say, I'm not where I used to be in my love and my passion for Christ. My affection for Him is not the same. And there are many people that would say that they equate affection for Christ and as they grow in theological knowledge. Now, theological knowledge is good. I love theological knowledge. And, and we have some great theological discussions around here, especially between Sunday school and church and after church. We get into a lot of that kind of a thing. But that's not the measure of your love for Christ and your walk with Christ. Those things are important. They play into it. But what are you practically doing out of love for Christ? Is your mind set on those things? And, 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 and I think about the church at Ephesus here. All of this, we look at the, at the Ephesians and many consider it the greatest book that's ever been written in the Bible and the scriptures and we see all of that. But, but, you, but you look to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4, and what is the message there to the church at Ephesus? So just a, basically a generation later, he said, you have left your first love. We need to examine. Is our first love still our first love? Is he still our first love? One of the things I would, would warn about this morning, especially to you younger Christians, is there's going to be many things come along in your life that are going to try to take away your affection for Christ and your focus upon Christ and the things of God. And let me say, as I've said before, I've been in the ministry for 50 years, and unfortunately many times through that I have seen Christians that seemingly for a period of time were what we would call on fire for the Lord and seem to have a great passion and love for the Lord, but they burned out and they turned away because other things came in that took away, that revealed that maybe that really wasn't a true love for Christ. But we need to set our minds on these things as, as has been told us here, as has been said to us here. And so, in very, and so it is, it is this, this place that we see here, as he talked about here and in these verses, finishing up this, this, these verses here in Colossians 3, he says, your life is hidden with Christ in God, and when Christ is your life appears, you're going to appear with him in glory. The promise there, 
the promise there as we think about the heavenly places and Christ being in the heavenly places that we are, as it says here, your life is hidden with Christ. My life is hidden with Christ even today. If you are a child of God, your life is hidden with Him even as He is sitting there at the right hand of the Father. Satan can't take that because he can't get to the the one who possesses our life. He is the eternal Son of God. He cannot be, his life can no longer, cannot be taken away at this point. And he's there eternally with the Father. Our life is hidden in him. He has paid the debt. Then he talks about here, some other things, if you, if we, as we look at this passage of Scripture, what all else does this mean about being in the heavenly places and being here? We have the promise here of our bodily resurrection, our glorification. But this verse also speaks to the spiritual reality that we now have an advocate, a great high priest at the Father's right hand who pleads for us, who represents us as the high, as the high priest did in the Old Testament. Do you remember that? Most of you probably equate the high priesthood in the Old Testament with Aaron. He was the first, the original. And over there in Exodus chapter 30 and verse 10, it talks about this. And in Leviticus 16 verses 15 through 19, it talks about how they're on the Day of Atonement once a year. What did he do? He went in there to the Holy of Holies. And let me tell you something, he was the only one that went. Because if you tried to go in there and you weren't, you know, you weren't the designated person, guess what? Uh, you died. And if Aaron or one of the high priests did something wrong, they died. In fact, what they would do is they tied a rope to his ankle. If he did something wrong and died in there, they had to drag him out by that rope. And I remember the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, gave strange fire in trying to worship in that that area, and they died. But... Aaron would go this once a year to represent the sins, to atone basically for the sins, give blood upon upon the mercy seat for the sins of the children of Israel. He was interceding for them in this one day a year. But Christ's intercession for us is not just one day in the year, but it is a constant interceding for us moment by moment. And so being raised up with Christ and being seated with Him in the heavenly places means we are in Christ spiritually in the presence of God now. Now, I mean, I I tried to think about that. Brother Wayne and I were up here the other day talking about it. I said, I I can't comprehend that. I, I, I don't know what that means, but I do know this. I know what it says is true. This is the inerrant inspired word of God that we are in Christ there in this particular present moment spiritually speaking. And God the Father looks upon the Son and he sees in Christ in his dearly beloved Son all those his Son died for and has saved and ever will save and all those that Christ is constantly interceding for until he returns again. We have, a, we have a high priest, the scripture says, that ever lives, that constantly lives in Hebrews 7 and 25 to make intercession for us and God the Father is gazing upon the Son and looking into the Son's face lovingly and but when he looks at him he doesn't just see him he sees us he sees us I, I, I wish somebody could explain that to me I'd probably have to go to heaven to find somebody to explain it to me but he sees us Our Father does not simply see and know us here on earth, but He beholds us. He sees us in the person of Christ in heaven. Even now He sees us and loves us as our Heavenly Father as He sees and beholds and loves Christ. He loves us. He sees us. 
We are seated with Christ. We are raised up with Him. We are seated with Him in the heavenly places. We know that He intercedes for us and that our prayers are heard, that our cries for help and grace to help in time of need are heard. Why? Because I'm there in the presence of God in the person of Christ. And He is interceding for me at this very moment. And when we gather for prayer over here, it's not just for show, but it's because we understand that we are in Christ and that He is our great high priest. And He says, yes, Father, I'm going to intercede on behalf of them as they pray. He intercedes for us. Our prayers are heard. Our cries for help and grace to help in time of need are heard and helped because we are His children and we are not coming to some despotic, tyrannical, earthly throne, but we are coming to the throne of one who loves us with an eternal love and has shown mercy and grace and sent His only begotten Son to die upon the cross out of that love. For God so loved that He gave His only begotten Son. We're told in another passage in Hebrews, He is able to say to the uttermost, those who draw near to God through Him, since He always lives, to make intercession for them. What surety for our salvation. Don't tell me that you can lose your salvation. Only if Christ died, and He's not. Because we are in Christ. Our life is hidden with Christ, in Christ. And what a blessing to know all of this. And even more, that we don't comprehend that we have as believers because of the truth of this verse. And I remember Paul's prayer over there in chapter 1 and verses 15 through 23. And he's praying there and praising God. And he prays that these Ephesian believers would be given the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him having the eyes of your heart enlightened. You know what? He wants us to know the greatness of the hope of our calling. He wants us to know the fullness of what it means to be in Christ, to be raised up with Christ. And it's found in the Scriptures. It's found in the Word of God as we already talked about the heavenly places and the blessings that we talked about in chapter 1 about what that means. He reveals this to us through the Word, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So if you want to understand what you are in Christ and what you have in Christ as a child of God, then you dig into the Word of God. And we walk, as we walk through the book of Ephesians, He reveals that more and more and more until it builds into this beautiful crescendo. And when we get to heaven, we will be in the presence of this one that has given us all of these spiritual blessings and we will praise Him time without end for that. And what does he say in verse 7 here? That he has raised us up with him. He has seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. So in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Here we see the purpose of God in being rich in mercy. And showing great love toward us. God, Paul says as God is going to show, meaning what it means is ability to show forth, to display for all to see there the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us. Now the coming ages, what does he mean there by the coming ages? Well, there's different words used in the Greek to describe ages. Some mean basically like a generation of man here, a time on earth, but that's not what he's talking about here. What he's talking about here is perpetuity without end. Ages without end. In the coming ages without end, God is going to display these, this kindness, the immeasurable riches of his grace and his kindness toward us. It's going to be displayed for us throughout all of this time. It speaks of that which is eternal and everlasting. 
It's the same word that's used in, in, in John 4 and 14 where Jesus told the Samaritan woman there, He said, if you drink of this water, drink of the water who is me, you will never thirst again. It means it's without end. This is what He's talking about here. There will not be any need of grace after we are glorified, but the benefits of God's grace will be on full display even in heaven. Why? Because we will be there. (laughs) The beneficiaries of the kindness, the immeasurable kindness and grace of God will be on display in the presence of God all of that time. And these immeasurable riches of of His grace, we've already spoken of this in chapter 1 and verse 7, that the word riches is used six times here in Ephesians. And that these riches of God are without end, they were without corruption, which gives us and corroborates the idea that we will be observing all of this for all of time through all of the coming ages without end. And they are immeasurable. Which means, in the literally in the original Greek, they are super abundant. They were without measure, humanly speaking, without end. Now I thought about this. You know, what does that mean? Immeasurable. I, I got to think. How, you know, I, I thought about some things that are of great measure. I think about the depth of the oceans. You know, I don't. We've never reached, I don't think, the lowest point in the oceans. I think it's like 30,000 feet. We don't even know what's down there in all of that. That's a great distance, but it's measurable. You think about the vastness of space. It's very vast. Man will never get to the end of it. But it's not immeasurable. But what is immeasurable is what is beyond that. The riches of the grace of God are immeasurable. And the basis of of this salvific and eternal grace is this kindness or also sometimes translated goodness of God shown to us in the person of Christ Jesus. Now some people say, well, as you look at this, when we talk about grace, I mean, I've heard different things said. What does grace mean? Well, it's the unmerited favor of God. That is true. I've heard the using the, uh, the uh, acrostic grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Yes, that is true. But what he's trying to talk about here is that this kindness and goodness was shown by God. How was it shown? In giving his eternal perfect son as the sacrifice for our sins. That is how God showed his goodness and his kindness toward us. It was the greatest kindness, the greatest good that has ever been or ever will be done is the giving of Christ for our sins. Nothing could compare in this world. In Romans 3 and 23, it says there is none good using this same word, no, not one. Men do not have the capability of being good in this way. But in Romans 2 and 4, it says that God's kindness, or we could say goodness, is meant to lead you to repentance. Man in his sinful state is not capable of such good, but God, who alone is perfectly good and perfectly kind, gave his only begotten Son to point to him that they might perhaps repent of their sins and believe on Christ for salvation. Hmm. Now doesn't it seem foolish that God would give the way of salvation? Say plainly, this is my beloved son. Believe on him. Listen to him. And yet man say, well, I don't, I'm going to spurn that kindness. I'm going to spurn that goodness. I'll choose my own way. Of course, we know which way that way leads. It leads to an eternity without God, without the presence of God, without salvation, in a place of horrible suffering. But for those who believe and will believe, God is going to show this super abundant, exceeding grace for all the ages to come. There's no end to it. The grace, the super abundant grace and kindness of God that we know now, it's only going to get better. (laughs) Because we're going to be in heaven. 
When our salvation is completed, when Christ has returned again and transformed these lowly bodies into a glorified body that bears the image of Christ because in 1 John 3 and 3 it says, We shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. What greater kindness and goodness and grace can be shown to us? None. I was reminded as I was studying this of the song, maybe some of you have never heard of it, probably you younger ones may have never heard of it. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. But in reality, God didn't just see and meet my need, but He determined to far super abundantly exceed my need. So not only do we get grace to make us right with God, but we get grace for in the here and now, for daily living, He pours out grace to us for every physical need, for every spiritual need. And we are rewarded by God's goodness and grace with an inheritance, as we've already said, that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. This is the super exceeding abundant kindness and grace of God that He has chosen to pour out on everyone that will ever be saved. And What should God's people be saying if they can say anything? Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. That you have chosen to do this for me. And what I see in the book of Revelation throughout eternity, those of us who have been partakers, recipients of this grace of God, are for all eternity going to glorify our God for His grace, for His abundant grace, for His exceeding grace, for His magnificent kindness. Uh, believer, I hope that you can appreciate today what God's done for you, what He's doing for you, what He is yet is prepared out there that we cannot imagine. Beyond the vastness of space is the third heaven where God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit and all of the host of those who are saved and the angelic beings will live for all eternity. And in the midst of that, He will continue to remind us and to show us the exceeding abundant kindness and grace that He has poured out upon us. And if you're without Christ today, let me say this. You don't have that promise. But I would say this. Christ has been lifted up. The gospel has been presented. If you are a sinner outside of Christ, as the Scripture says, call upon Him while He may be found. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. May we pray. How...